Uh, Andrea and the book reunited Jimmy Jam, Cornbread's father and son, uh, for the first time in decades. And that story had always been Minneapolis music lore. You know, Jimmy is rocking it, Cornbread's over here. And so Andrea, by way of telling, I'll just keep talking. <laughs> His story, you know, um, brought them together, and uh, the crescendo was this beautiful moment at the Cedar a, a few weeks ago, and just incredible. Um, the other part of it that I really, really appreciated, and I know we talked about this when you were writing the book, is your fir use of first person and bringing us through the actual research and I mean, you, you could have gone so far as to say what was going on in your own life, even, you know, more. But that was really, um, we were as engaged as you were because of that, you know. And we're following along with you as a detective, you know, uncovering these tidbits and these his, bits of history that Cornbread himself didn't know, that Jimmy didn't know, that, you know, your beloved Minnesota music community didn't know. Um, and so that's all my admiration for it. And, you know, I just, uh, I love it so much. And, and you know, how much, of, how much of being a new parent kind of guided you in uh, the heartfelt part of the, the telling of this story, would you say? Mm, I mean, I was probably pregnant for most of the actual writing, so those hormones were just coursing. <laughs> I'm sure it contributed in some way. And then, you know, I have a, my older daughter was maybe just three when I started this whole thing with cornbread, so I was going between being at home with a three-year-old and then going to visit my 94-year-old friend. And I noticed right away that there were a lot of similarities in the way that I spoke to them. Um, and Corbett often refers to his period of life now as his second childhood. Um, so that was just kind of an interesting thing to note. Um, but there was just like a real purity to being with him and he's so present and it's so about the moment that you're in right there with him. Um, his A lot of his memories have faded away and um, it's just, yeah, it was really striking to me to, to see that I was spending so much of my time with these people where you're just right there with them. Yeah. And it's not about worrying about the future or things that have happened in the past. You're just in the now. Right. And fascinating with uh, Cornbread, as you played him recordings of him playing with Augie Garcia, you know, one of the first records that ever came out of here and bands that ever came out of here. And yet he's transported to that time, you know. There's so much to be said about the book, and I mean, we all know people with Alzheimer's and memory loss, and Cornbread has it to a degree, but the music has kept his, his whole uh, thing running. Absolutely. Yeah. That was um, something that I, my parents are huge Cornbread fans, and when I was talking to my dad about the book, he's like, I hope that you got Cornbread's sense of humor in there, because he is still so incredibly witty and sharp, and his wit is really fast, um, and he will surprise you with the things that he says. I never know what's going to come out of his mouth, which makes it delightful to do interviews with him. Um, but I noticed that, too. Like he, It was kind of an ordeal to track down all these old Augie Garcia recordings, and so I'd bring like one at a time that I found on eBay or wherever I was able to track it down, and we would press play, and it was like the moment the needle drops. He just... Incredible. goes to that time and he would you know open his eyes and it's like you could see him looking at Augie and remembering all these moments and he was so so proud of the fact that they played at this River Road Club and packed the place four nights a week sure. he, he loves remembering back to that time and it must have been so exciting you know they were the hot new band playing this right. new, new kind of music and for a really young crowd that was just coming out and experiencing like what it's like to dance in a club, you know, all together right, as teenagers. Right. Um, so it was really fun to and see him. And he lived through that. Yes. And he's talking about it. I mean, we were talking about a movie we saw the other day. Oh, is it so you know, It's like, <laughs> it's calling up his, his whole youth. Yeah. Let's back up just a second. Tell us about yourself. Um, 
how did you grow up? How did you get interested in music and history and, and maybe anything that uh, led to you making these last two very important history, music history books? Well, I grew up in a musical home. My parents are huge music fans, so that was just an entryway really early in life. Um, I loved records. My dad played guitar and my mom played piano. So I loved being around people making music. Um, and it was always like our happiest times as a family was when we were doing music stuff. So I knew that that was going to be part of my life. When I was a teenager, I started reading Pioneer Press, yes. <laughs> which we got delivered to my you know, teenage home in Apple Valley and started following your columns. And that's when I started learning this connection between the music that was really interesting and also that it was happening here. Yeah. And there was something really exciting to me about reading about a band that was just coming out, you know, like a Mason Jennings or yeah. Dan Israel or Martin Devaney or, you know, they were all really young and new at that point. And then I could go to Cheapo and buy their CD and yeah, then I right. could follow them and go see them play at some coffee shop or 400 bar or whatever. And there was something so interesting to me about that. It just felt like I was starting to tap into being part of like a larger community and a culture mm -hmm. for the first time um, and then I don't really know where the history part comes mm -hmm. in other than I'm just really personally interested in it you know people have asked me like oh did you study that in school how did you learn to do all this research and I have no idea yeah. <laughs> I just it's something that I get really curious about and then I start obsessing about it and then I yeah. can't let it go until right. I like figure it out right. and I'll just look up after you know there's been days where I'm like I have been in the mic like microfilm for six hours and I don't even know what I'm looking for anymore yeah. but it's fun yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't know what why I find that really fun no it's the obsessive <laughs> thing it's I know it well and I mean I think it goes to um, uh, got to be something here that that line and there was a kernel that you had to follow much in the same way with cornbread when did you first hear Cornbread play? And, you know, tell the story actually about how the book came to be because to me it's a great story of uh, just sort of trusting the process, the creative process, and um, how something that starts off to be one thing ends up to be this. What, what happened? Well, so I had met Cornbread at NPR. He came in to do a session with me and Tom Weber. We we're hosting it together. And I had never seen him live before. I only knew his music because he had started putting out these live albums and they would send him in and I thought it was really charming and I really liked the way he played and it, there was something really timeless about his music and I found it captivating. So we brought him in. We were utterly charmed by his whole deal. <laughs> Just his personality, his storytelling, his gift for connecting with people. Um, at one point, he was trying to get Tom and I to sing along with him. You know, it was like, why aren't you doing what people always do when I play? <laughs> why are you just staring at me? And it was <laughs> just kind of funny. The pros, yeah. the radio pros. Everyone's like, <laughs> we don't want to wreck it. <laughs> Can't sing on the podcast. Can't sing on the radio. Yeah. But it was, he played um, Put the World Back Together, yeah, right on. which was just mesmerizing and he played deeper blues and you know, all of his greatest cornbread hits um, and I just loved it I loved every minute of it I, I left with this huge smile on my face and I was like this man is just remarkable and at that point he was only 90 <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> so then a few years later we got through the pandemic early days and uh, I left NPR in April of 2021 and like four weeks later, I got this text from Jimmy Jam, <laughs> and it said, um, hey, Andrea, I'm coming to town, and I'm wondering if you could help me get a hold of my dad. Mm -hmm. And I just read it like, huh, that's how interesting that he's reaching out to a local DJ, you know, mm -hmm. to, to put him in touch with his father. Mm -hmm. um, and I didn't know a lot about their story at that point in the kind of ins and outs of it, but I said, obviously, yes, I'll help you and put him in touch with the right people to kind of make that happen. And then after they met up, I got a, another text from Jimmy 
and it was a picture of Jimmy and Cornbread and uh, Jimmy's son, Max, who's Cornbread's grandson. And it said, um, hey, Andrea, I just wanted to thank you for making that happen. That was the first time we'd spoken in 35 years. Wow. And Cornbread got to meet his grandson, Max, who's, wow. who was 21 at that point. And we're both on cloud nine. Wow. And just thank you. And I just started crying. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's just like, whoa. So it, it was just such an interesting timing thing. I'd just gone through like a health thing too. And it, so I was in like this really vulnerable place in my life. And to have this just kind of fall into my lap, it was like, I didn't feel like I had a choice. It was mm -hmm. like, this is what I'm doing now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I went to see Cornbread a few days later and it was, you know, 2021. So we were masked in his um, daycare facility sitting in the hallway. And they said, Cornbread, I want to write a book about you. No. Okay. But, but. When did that happen? When did you get that idea? Within the, days. Like, right yeah, on, It was right literally on. like a week later. Right on, I went right, and said, right. I think we should do this. Yeah, and you were working on another book. I was. And, you, and do you talk about what that was or or not? Because uh, are you still working on it? Or? Yeah. Yeah, right well, on. Okay. Theoretically. <laughs> right, right. But so you, you, I mean, that's an amazing pivot, it, right? I mean. I literally called my editor, Eric Anderson, as I was leaving Cornbread's. And I said, um, what if, <laughs> instead of this other book, yeah. we do a biography of cornbread? And he and I talked at length about what this book was going to be because it, we didn't know if this was like a one-off thing that had happened with Jimmy, if they were going to talk again, like what the situation was, right. and if it was going to be part of something he would want to talk about in his book. Right. Um, I didn't know if it should be a biography, like by Andrea Swenson about cornbread, if it should be by him and his voice, and I'm like helping him write right. it. Like right. it was really wide open. Yeah. And then it was um, probably later that summer, I had been working with cornbread for a few months. And I realized um, every time we got together, which was, at that point we started getting together weekly, he would say things like, you know, that meeting with Jimmy was just so great, but I just can't get a hold of him. Like he gave me this phone number and it's all beeps and boops when I call it and it's just not getting through. I mean, what a metaphor, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I just, don't, I don't know if he gave me the wrong number or if I'm blocked or like what, but I can't get anyone. I've had my friends try and I've tried and it's like, oh, that's so weird. Um, but he kept bringing it up and I'm like, oh, he wants me to help. Like he's, he's not saying it, but he's saying it. Yeah. So I texted Jimmy and I said, hey, I wanted to let you know I'm working on this project with your dad and I'm wondering if you'd like to be involved. And he wrote back right away and it was like, absolutely, I'm, I'm in. But it was really tentative. Mm -hmm. at, you know, I really wanted it to be something that it felt like Cornbread and I were in partnership on and that mm -hmm. it was really going to be focused on him and his life. That was really important to me and mm -hmm. it was, I think, important to him too. So anytime I communicate with Jimmy, I always told him first and told him exactly what he said and I was kind of like this little carrier pigeon yeah, right, <laughs> going right. between them. <laughs> um, Jimmy said he would sit down to do an interview with me so I actually flew to LA and spent a whole day with him in his studio and talked at length about all of these things and at the very end, this is so Minnesotan of both of us, <laughs> he walked me out to my car. Um, I think I'd been there for six hours or something. And we had this long Minnesota goodbye. And yeah. at the very end, I was like, would you ever want to get on a Zoom with your dad? <laughs> and he was like, sure. Cool. <laughs> so then we started doing that. And it's been, I mean, we've probably done 45 or 50 Zoom calls between Amazing. the two of them. And it's just, the whole thing is, it's been a, it's just one small step after another yeah. in this evolution. I mean, it's, again, it's, amazing. it's an amazing history book, but it's like a living, you know, telling of, this reconciliation that is so beautiful and so musical. Um, it culminated at the Cedar, like we were talking about a few weeks ago, and uh, Cornbread and Jimmy played with Andrea at the piano side, and seeing Jimmy Jam play <laughs> with his father on dueling keyboards, trading licks, and you know, it was as beautiful a musical moment as I have ever seen in my life. Yeah. And it was just absolutely precious. And, uh, you know, you talked about it being sacred. 
and you, you have to continue feeling that way, uh, knowing that you had such a large part in that. I mean, it's it's really it's it's I can't just stop gushing about it. Um, and I can't wait to see the, the film. They filmed yeah. that at the Cedar, right? Yeah. Too, right on. So we get to see that. Um, talk about that idea of writing in the first person. You weren't sure at first. You weren't sure if, it, like you were saying, it was going to be all in cornbreads. That's I, I appre again. I appreciate it because the book has urgency. You know, you say a couple of times, I didn't know how much time I had with mm -hmm. both because the man is closing in on a hundred, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, just time and you don't know. Yeah. How, how did that go? And and I mean, I obviously the first person is I. I think it's universal, and but it really does allow us to be right there with you on the hunt and and in all the fields too. <laughs> yes, so many feelings. Yeah. I'm really relieved to hear you say that because it, it was something that I second guessed throughout the whole thing. Um, I felt like this is their story; it's not my story. Like I wanted to stay out of it, but also like I'm in the middle of it, right. <laughs> and I can't describe it without explaining at least a little bit of my role in all of this. I mean, to this day, Jimmy's only ever called Cornbread directly once. Like, every communication that they have is through my iPad. Wow. <laughs> and it's, um, I don't want to feel like I'm taking credit for it, but it is like, it's been like a lot of like nurturing and facilitation and just trying to like gently encourage them to like have a relationship <laughs> with yeah. each other. Um, so I just didn't feel like I could explain what that experience was like without describing it from my vantage point. Um, and I really just only wanted to do it because it felt like then you were sitting next to me as we're going to Cornbread's house and as we're sitting down with him at his piano and we're turning on the Zoom and Jimmy's popping up and I just wanted people to feel like they're kind of going on this ride with me. Yeah. Um, and. It, yeah, it just it was something I never was really confident in until the end, I think, and then I realized that it needed to be that way. Well, and the, and the great part of it, too, is that it, it, I mean, it's a history book in that it it's written with a certain outrage, too, that this story hasn't been told, and it tells the whole story of, you know, a black man, an African-American man this age in St. Paul, and... Minneapolis and the suburbs, uh, and I, I appreciate that greatly. And you, you know, you nailed it. You're, 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 so reading both the lines and between the lines, you know, we're outraged with you. Like, how has this story not been told? It was wild to me to realize that the first time Cornbread Harris was actually in the paper was 40 years into his career, which is wow. Wild. I mean, he was, he had ads where it mentioned he was playing at different clubs. There would be like a line that said like, there's going to be a party and playing is like Jimmy Harris and his swing masters or whatever. But the actual cornbread Harris, the piano player, the, the, you know, bluesman, Jimmy Jam's father, that wasn't until after Jimmy was famous. Incredible. And that was the lead is Jimmy Jam's dad, cornbread Harris, Incredible. is playing at Nikki's Cafe. And I mean, at that point, he had led six or seven different groups. He right. had all these ups and downs of success. He'd been on, you know, multiple regional hit records in right. various roles. It's just amazing that you know he was just existing kind of on the periphery of what people were recording in the newspaper. But right. it's not surprising either. I mean, when I was doing my research on my first book, it was really hard to find any mention of a lot of these black bands from the 60s and 70s in any newspaper, and they were really popular and bringing yeah. in you know hundreds of people at these clubs and things, but it just, like music journalism was different, and then also the just racial barrier was so strong oh. that it was really hard to get that kind of attention. Yeah, it, it occurs to me, um, I mean, just how great Cornbread is um, as a musician, and it had to remind me sometimes of Jimmy, of Prince, I mean, these these figures, these humans, that the music pulses through, right? I mean, did that strike you? Yes. Being around? Oh, yeah. yeah. I feel so lucky that I've had, 
I can hear Corbett saying, you're not lucky, you're blessed. blessed. You're blessed you. <laughs> I'm a blessed dude because I, <laughs> I, have, the, I have the you're tote bait. I'm a blessed dude. You're a blessed lady. <laughs> yes, that is the too good. Yeah. <laughs> because I have spent every Tuesday of the last three years sitting across from him, and he always plays piano for me, yeah. and it's just absolutely mesmerizing the way that he transforms like when he's playing you know it's the journey to his bench has gotten more arduous over time and mm -hmm. it's quite an ordeal for him to even just let me into the house and get over to his piano but then he starts playing and his fingers are still so light, light and it's so fluid Incredible. and it's you can just see like he's not thinking about it anymore yeah. it's just it's feeling and it's flowing and it's so beautiful and the more inspired he is the better it gets so the first time that Jimmy was on Zoom, he immediately turned around and it was like, hi, hold on. And then he turns around and he goes to his piano and he says, this is deeper blues, I'm a bluesman. And Jimmy goes, I know. <laughs> <laughs> it's back to being a kid. Yeah, right, right, right. <laughs> and he played the hell out of that song and it was like, when on those days when he's really fired up, you can just feel it coming out of him when he's playing. It's so great. Tell us about the Cedar, your, your POV of the Cedar show. Um, and did Jimmy say anything to you afterwards or did the band, did Cadillac, uh, what was that all like <laughs> for you that night? Oh, um, well leading up to that show, I just, I knew that we had one shot to do this whole thing right for these guys. Yeah. They had to play together one other time at the Hook and Ladder on Cornbread's 95th birthday. But they had also played over Zoom dozens of times. I hear it all the time. And it's so tender and sweet and intimate. And the fact that Cornbread in his mid-90s figured out, oh, there's a delay on Zoom, so we'll just do call and response. Like, that's amazing. He's so innovative and creatively wow. in that way. So he's usually the one guiding, like, play this, play that. Here's my song. And he's taught Jimmy the chord progressions to all his songs. And it's just, I've cried so, so much just sitting there watching them play together. So I knew like we have to clear the stage and give them time for people to just like really absorb how special it is when they play and how much they're communicating to each other. But everyone there felt like we were part of something, just like I use the word sacred, but it felt really like I was almost out of my body. Like it just felt like we were doing something so special. and. I knew that we need to have it filmed, so I somehow figured that out. <laughs> Cornbread is so inspiring. He's made me start a record label. Yeah. <laughs> he didn't make me. Just, he inspired me to start a record label to release his music. I hired a film crew and figured out how to like raise money to make a documentary. Like it's just there's a lot happening because I'm so passionate about making sure this is all captured yeah. for everybody and that we can experience it forever. Cool. Um, but we were all just really, really beside ourselves that evening and then Jimmy's been so inspired by that experience. He's texting me nonstop every day about what we can do to get the word out. Um, he drove the album to the recording academy and submitted it for a historical album, oh, which cool. is like, cool. what a way to show his respect to his dad. You know, yeah. that's like how he knows how to, you know, yeah, really yeah. say this is important. And um, we're starting to do media things together. We're going to be on uh, the Tamron Hall show yes. on October 10th. I'm going to yes. go up to New York and Carpet's going to be here on Zoom with us. Amazing. So he's just like, I, I mean, it's crazy. Like, it's talking to Jimmy is like how many celebrities can come up in a 20 minute conversation. But um, he's so excited to just be handing out the book to people in his life and like sharing the story and sharing how important it is to him that he could be reconnected with his dad. and it's become beyond anything I could have ever yeah. predicted. And I think it's just, I, there was one call we were doing a while ago where I was reading the book. I read like a chapter at a time to Cornbread and mm -hmm. Jimmy found out I was doing this. So he wanted to come in and <laughs> listen to it, which was very nerve wracking to read it to both of them at once. But <laughs> um, there was one day where I forget what passage I was reading, but Cornbread was just weeping like the whole time. And he looked oh. up and he was like, I'm sorry guys, I don't know what all this is. And I said, well, it's healing, you're healing. And Jimmy's like, that's right, he's healing. <laughs> he's like, we're all healing. Oh my God. <laughs> it's 
so much. It's, I know, it really is. It, there's been it so really many is. moments where I'm like, I have to lie down. I don't know. I mean, <laughs> the book's only a month old, too. I, know. I mean, you know, it, and so what other miracles await? Do you want to read something? Sure. Uh, we didn't do that, but I, and then take questions. I don't know if we're doing this right, but <laughs> good? All right. There's no rules. All right. <laughs> so since we set up what the book is, I'm going to read one of my favorite parts, which is at the very end. Um, all right. It's not very long. Don't worry. <laughs> when Cornbread and I talked to Jimmy, the younger Harris would often break out into mini soliloquies about the things he'd learned about human nature. And one idea he returned to in our calls was how he believed that over time, people forgot most of the details about who said what or who did what to whom in any given moment. Speaking to us over Zoom one day, Jimmy noted, people don't remember the details of stuff, but what they do remember is how you made them feel. Amen, you nailed that one, Cornbread responded. I think you might have said that before once or twice, but that's okay, he added laughing. You can repeat your hits, Jimmy joked. Yep, Cornbread agreed, like I say, put it at the beginning of the book, put it at the end of the book, keep repeating that good stuff. As I reflected more on what Jimmy said, I recognized just how remarkable it was that for decades, all that existed for both of them was how the other one had made them feel. But now, right in front of my eyes, they had somehow arrived at a place where they were able to change that feeling. Much like a jazz chord progression might build up tension across several bars of a song before resolving into a more serene major chord, the end of Cornbread's song brought him back to the root note and rang out in a clear, bright harmony. When I first heard Cornbread sing Deeper Blues, I got hung up on the heartache of the lyrics and the bitter feelings of resentment expressed by the song's protagonist. In our later days together, as I listened to him play it alone at his piano, I saw that the way Cornbread composed the song actually expressed an undeniable feeling of hope that no matter how painfully life might twist and turn us, there's always another opportunity to break into a joyful chorus and end in a major key. One of my favorite cornbread songs is an original instrumental composition that he titled Never Ending Love Song. It has a serene, meditative quality, especially when he performs it alone. It sounds like it could be a long lost Vince Guaraldi track for one of the Charlie Brown movies, or maybe the score to a short film about finding a river to skate away on. When I asked him where the melody came from, cornbread shrugged and said, I'm confused about that one myself. It's something that kept going through my mind kept getting stuck in there, so I said, okay, I'll give it a title. He turned around on his bench and floated away, gently hammering on a single note and then fluttering around to the rest of the melody's swirling notes. My band said, what are you going to call that? And I said, never ending love song. So you don't know where it started or where it ends, I observed. That's right. It's something that just came into my brain and there it was in such continuity. I mean, actually a nice chorus top line, you know? I'd never heard anything exactly like that. So there it was. So I play the song and I tell the people, I say, well, the song has ended, but the love is still going out. What better way to summarize my time spent with this remarkable artist and man? Of course, the song didn't end that day. He was so energized by talking about the composition that he had to place his hands back over the piano keys and stir up the melody for another go round. As I sat there listening, I had the same feeling that I experienced the first time I watched him play in the studio and every time I went to see him at Palmer's and all the other times I'd seen him wander his way around those keys. For the beautiful, fleeting moment that existed inside that song, there was only Cornbread and his piano, one man communing with his muse, channeling all of the hardships and triumphs of his long life into a beautiful melody and gathering every last bit of his strength to send all the love from his fingertips out into the spectacular, blessed universe. Andrea Swenson, you Amazing. Beautiful. Um, I, I, I told you earlier, I teared up a lot reading the book, and um, it's very musical, it's really beautiful, and congrats again. Let's do some questions people. Let's go. <laughs> Any questions? Comments? Who was at the Cedar Show? Oh. <laughs> no, there's a hole. It was so special. Oh, oh yeah.
That is the word, special. Yeah, yeah. Man. You know, it, it occurs to me that, um, this is just a comment, not a question, but you respect your elders. Mm. I mean, you know, there is not a lot of, I mean, when I, you know, I also am an elder here, but I mean, it, it, I do as a writer, always. I always have. And I've always reached for that. And this is kind of the ultimate, you know, version of that. And not all writers uh, have a radar like that. So another another appreciation post for that. So. <laughs> I remember you reminded me of a funny comment. Um, after my first book came out, we did this big show at the Fitzgerald with we Willie Walker and the Valdons, mm -hmm. Andre Simone was there, and right. Wanda Davis. And it was so great. And I posted this picture of everyone, and someone bitter <laughs> wrote a comment, when are you gonna get back to covering all these musicians out here working it in the clubs? Like I was ignoring, I don't know, real musicians in this person's mind. And I thought, what an interesting <laughs> comment. Like, so many people don't realize that there's musicians in their 70s and 80s still working right. out in the clubs. And in Corbett's case, in his late 90s, still right. working out in the clubs. Right. And if anyone deserves to get some shine, it should be someone that's been doing Absolutely. it for seven decades. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. But there's that attitude again in the here and now. Mm -hmm. You know. Yes. So, yeah. Great work. Yeah. Questions? Anyways, I think you're up to sign. Yeah. All right. Good. Let's do it. Oh, I was going to oh, say, um, at the, at the um, Taste of Minnesota, uh, like that thing mm -hmm. downtown, that, you know, oh, this summer, yeah. I managed to um, get backstage and talk to Jimmy Tim. And then I said that I had been at the Hook and Ladder show and I had recorded um, um, the world one. I can't put, put the world yeah, back Yeah, put the world back yeah. together. And, I, and he had shared it to his story. And he was like, oh. And then anyway, he goes, it was a Sunday afternoon, and he said, my dad would be here, but he has a gig today. <laughs> oh, and, so, uh, and so he was at Homer's instead of seeing yes. flight time and more change in time and everybody downtown. And yeah, I mean, how, I mean, what a work ethic. He, yeah. Yeah, he uh, will never miss a gig if he's got one on the books. He's very proud about that. <laughs> what I mean, hey, being a band leader, for that long, I, for any amount of time, is incredible. And I was watching him at the Cedar with that, and all those guys circling around him. Oh yeah. You know, I mean Jimmy that night, but the whole band just like, and he knows it, and it's just his fingers. And no, he, a couple of times he go, no, uh uh. It's <laughs> <laughs> ninety six. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Wow. It's amazing at Palmer's too. The, it's the same thing. You know, all these guys come in and they basically sit in a circle around him, and he's just facing forward with his back to the band and the audience. But they follow him so yeah. closely, yeah. and he's always the one driving the bus. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so Andrew, I know the whole night you had to be this is really special for you. But is there a moment that sticks out in your mind from the show at the Cedar? Oh. Well, not to start crying again, but yeah. um, no, I didn't want to make you cry. <laughs> I mean, the the band part was like I was so physically relieved because all the stress was off of me having to do anything anymore that I was just like, woohoo! I had a glass of wine. It was great. I danced with my daughter. <laughs> but when we were on stage, um, just Cornbread and Jimmy and I, um, the moment that I kept replaying in my mind the next morning was um, we were talking to him about the Augie Garcia days. And when he was speaking, the whole room was so quiet. I mean, this was like, the cedar was like, do we have too many people in here? It was so packed. There was not a single space you could even stand anymore. But everyone was absolutely silent. And he got into his story and he's like, yeah, you know, we were playing the River Road Club and we used to pack the place. And then he looked around and he was like, did we pack this place? <laughs> <laughs> and Jimmy and I just said, you packed it, Cornbread, you packed it. And then everyone just roared and he could feel it. And it was like, whoa. Yeah. <laughs> it was like he kind well, of almost forgot for a minute that it wasn't just the three of us, you know? And it was so beautiful yeah. for him to feel that love from the audience. I just, I love that so yeah. much. Yeah. Beautiful. Uh, makes me think of a question. I volunteer at the Cedar, so I really love the place. And I was really proud that this took place there. And I was wondering why the Cedar was chosen. 
I first got the idea for the cedar early on when I was working on the book. I went out to like a lady brunch with a bunch of Minnesota music ladies, um, which was really great. There were like 12 of us that all do various things. And um, Michelle was there. She had just taken over as director of the cedar and also Mary Brayback, the booker. And I was talking about car break because that's all I do these days. And they're like, you guys have to do the release show here. And like two years went by and I was still working on the book and I reached out and said, you know, are you still interested? And they're like, absolutely. And they made it so easy and just so effortless. I mean, I asked for a lot of different things that night. I brought in this huge film crew. The film crew brought a crane that had never gone into a theater before. <laughs> <laughs> which was like a whole thing yeah. and we um i asked the only thing i asked for in our rider is a cornbread special and the jimmy jam special backstage they each have their own signature drink <laughs> and they made them they it's like each oh. one has like four ingredients and they had everything backstage and i was like this everything was just so thoughtful and they made it feel so warm and i knew that it was going to feel like that because that space is there's something really cool about that space and the people that work there so i'm really glad that we could yeah, make that happen. Cool. And, and tell, what time did they leave? <laughs> yeah. So the show was two hours long. We did two sets. And then they signed autographs for another two hours. And by the time that we were walking out the door, every chair was put away. They mopped the floor. <laughs> <laughs> the crane left. <laughs> the film crew went next door and got drunk at Palmer's. It was like the whole place was cleared out and it was just cornbread signing books next to Jimmy. And, and literally, like the last person came up and he finished and he looked up and he goes, Oh, is that all? <laughs> <laughs> so it was one in the morning when I, I snapped a picture of them waiting outside for their cars. And that was awesome. So you're keeping notes and we're going to read another chapter. Of this, please. Yes, Aww. I mean, right? I mean, that's what we keep saying. It, There's got to be a sequel, back or yeah. a sequel, or something, <laughs> or expanded edition, yeah, yeah, or, yeah. or so the much movie. more to write. Exactly. <laughs> so, yeah. will, will, will the film be shown ever? Yes. Okay. So, um, <laughs> uh, I own all the footage, along with we're making sure to own it in partnership with the Minneapolis Sound Museum. That was really important to everyone involved. Um, so they will always have the raw footage and the goal is to make a short documentary about this whole story that will be shown when the museum is open but also available just as a release. Um, and I'm hoping to get out to LA soon. My friend Susan Ricketts is going to be directing it and she's very talented. I met her working on print stuff and um, she's great. So she is the one that orchestrated the <laughs> crane and the, the whole thing. and. Um, she's helped me learn very quickly about what it takes to make a documentary and we're going to be producing it kind of in partnership. So, um, hopefully it'll be soon, but, um, I'm kind of learning as I go with all this about how long things take, but we, I should mention we've had some amazing support already. I was able to fundraise, um, to make sure that we had like all the right equipment and people that we needed. And, um, actually the owner of, uh, Berlin is one of our biggest backers um so we've gotten some amazing support and you can just feel anytime we send out an email and it said cornbread jimmy jam reunion cedar they were like what do you need <laughs> so cool. that was really really cool um just how many people came together to to support that great anything else guys what's the target date for the museum that i'm not sure but i know their goal is to do a pop-up first um, they want to do like just one pop-up exhibit that would be within someone else's building. Um, and I've been ad advising on, um, it's going to be about the Way Community Center. So um, hopefully soon that we could do something smaller like that and then continue to help them fundraise. Um, they've been doing these really great annual events at the Capri um, every June. And those are all just meant to kind of build awareness and also collect stories. Those are also filmed um, and recorded. Um, all the people that they bring together to interview for those. So it's just kind of one of those things, like how I felt about this book. Like you just, you've got a vision and you just keep plugging away <laughs> and eventually, hopefully it'll take shape. That's what Paul Peterson says in the book. Mm -hmm. Peterson's, we just ask. Yeah. It's a very good creative tag. 
Make them say no. Make them yeah. say no. Right, right. <laughs> oh. Great stuff. Yeah. Andrea Swenson, you guys. One more time. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Jim. What a great mom. Right? <laughs> a great mom. Great <laughs> 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 What a great daughter.